Wolfgang Pauli of the Pauli Exclusion Principle had a famous quote that goes, God made the bulk, but the surface was invented by the devil. Referring to the fact that surfaces share a border with the external world. And understanding and controlling phenomena along these boundaries is diabolical and devilishly complicated. So let me give you an example of a devilishly complicated surface that my lab has been trying to understand. The cell membrane. If we zoom into the interface, the boundary of a single cell, we're going to find a barrier that separates the inside of the cell from the outside environment the external world. And this thin barrier is made up of a lipid bilayer. In addition to the bilayer, there are proteins, sugars, and other macromolecules that are embedded within this bilayer. And it's well known that the spatial and temporal organization of these species along the interface plays a key role in the way the cells interact with the surrounding fluid, other cells, and the rest of the external world. Now, a part of my lab has been developing molecular probes to understand the dynamics of the species along the interface. So in collaboration with Professor Dan Fletcher's lab at UC Berkeley, we've developed molecular probes and by understanding how they insert into lipid bilayer and how much inserts into the bilayer, we can start to understand the spatial and temporal organization of the lipids and the proteins and sugars sitting along this thin membrane. Now, what has been devilishly more complicated for my lab to understand is how the spatial and temporal organization of these species is governed by an underlying cytoskeleton, which is a network of protein biopolymers called actin biopolymers. They are cross-linked, and there are also molecular motors called myosin that can grab onto strands of the biopolymer and generate forces along this cytoskeleton. And these forces can be large enough to generate macroscopic flows along this thin interface. So there are examples both on the level of single cells and also whole organisms like parasites that exhibit macroscopic flows that happen along this surface. And it's known that the dynamics of this cytoskeletal network and the cell membrane are coupled together. So the goal of this presentation is to understand this coupling. How do the active forces and flows generated within this cytoskeleton transmit to the organization of the species along this interface? So my student, Daniel Arnold, went to chase this question. And what he did was to develop a synthetic reconstituted model of the cell membrane by taking two different types of lipids. First, the lipid on the left, DOPC, and a lipid called DPPC. The only difference between these two lipids is that DOPC has a double bond along its acyl tail, the chain, and therefore the, the DOPC has a small kick along its tail. So when you mix these two lipid types together, due to steric interactions, they're going to macroscopically phase separate into two domains, two phases. One phase, called liquid disordered, LD, which is enriched in DOPC. Another phase called liquid ordered, which is enriched in DPPC. Now, the macroscopic phase separate, just like any classical phase separation in 3D, like oil and water, except this is happening along a thin 4 nanometer interface. Now, if we image from the bottom, you're going to get a picture that looks something like this. We've added a green fluorophore that enriches in the LO phase. That's why it appears circular and green. That's what you're seeing, the fluorophore. The background phase, which is dark, that's liquid disordered, the majority phase. We didn't add any fluorophores there. That's why it appears black and dark. What I wanted you to remember is that there's a lipid bilayer across this entire field of view. We are only visualizing the LO domain in the LO phase. And that's going to be true for the rest of this presentation. Now, when Daniel heats up the system, everything melts into a single phase. But then what we can do is to cool it to room temperatures, and what you're going to see is the spontaneous nucleation of domains within this field of view that slowly grow as a function of time. So we can plot the domain size A of each of these domains as a function of time and plot it over here. Domain size as a function of time. And all the experimental data fall along a single universal line of time to the one-third power. 
This is a well-known scaling in the kinetics of phase separation. Domains grow circular or spherical in 3D, and they grow slowly, like time to the one-third power. Now, there are different mechanisms that can explain the scaling of time to the one-third power, coalescence, and Oswald ripening, which I'll get to a little bit later in this talk. Good. So everything that I'm showing here on this slide is our well-known results. People in the past have also found this time to the one-third scaling. For example, Sarah Keller's lab have found this for lipid bilayers, but this is a generally known result for the kinetics of phase separation. Nothing new here. So how does all of this picture change when you add active flows? So what Daniel did was to get actin biopolymers to bind onto the bulk majority phase, the LD phase, and if we add molecular motors, the motors will pull along the filaments, which will generate flows and forces along the bulk majority phase, which, if we're successful, will entrain through the forces and flows the LO green domains, and we would like to see what happens. In particular, we would like to see two things about the system. First, we'd like to understand how does the size of the domains change when you add active flows. Secondly, we like to see how the active flow modulates the structure. So first, let's talk about size. Here's an experimental realization of the domains on the upper left, the actin network, and the composite. So this is a realization of the active flow plus membrane that Daniel developed. Now, when I play this movie, we're going to see is the onset of molecular motors that will grab onto the filaments and pull. As you can see that the actin network is moving along the surface, and the corresponding domains are being entrained by those forces and flows, and you can clearly see domains are no longer circular, they're elongating, they're stretching, they're fusing, they're undergoing fission, and qualitatively the feature looks very different. So now we could take the same metric that I measured earlier of the domain size as a function of time. We saw that earlier it was time to the one-third scaling. We could plot it for the exact same metric for this active system, and what we find is that across different experimental realizations, they all fall along an accelerated coarsening. So the domains are growing faster as a function of time when you add these active flows. And it seems like all the data fall along a time to the two-thirds scaling. Good. So we'd like to now return to the two mechanisms I explained earlier of coalescence and also ripening to explain why we see this accelerated coarsening. First, let's talk about coalescence. Now, this is a theory developed by Akanksha, who is also a student in our lab. The coarsening, based on coalescence, interprets the lipid domains as a colloidal particle of some size A separated by a distance r. Now, what we can do is to write down an evolution equation for the pair distribution function g, which satisfies a convection diffusion equation. There's diffusion because the domains are colloidal and they can fluctuate in space. They can interact with each other. And lastly, there could be convective forcing on them. In our case, could be active flows. The boundary conditions are that when the domains come into contact, the pair problem is gone because they have infinitely uh, quickly reacted and the pair problem is gone. And so the value of the pair distribution goes to zero. It's like an infinitely fast chemical reaction happening at contact. The second boundary condition is that very far away, the domains are completely uncorrelated, and therefore the, the, the pair distribution scales as the singlet domain density squared. Now, we can integrate this equation over all possible distances r, and you get an evolution equation for the singlet density n, which has a sink term j, which is a contact integral over the pair flux. So physically what this represents is that as the domains come into contact, the frequency at which they come into contact will directly inform how quickly the domain density is going down as a function of time. So we could rewrite this as an effective rate constant times the singlet density squared. Okay? Now you can go through this string of arguments to obtain the evolution equation, the density as a function of time. Separately, we know that there's a constant area fraction of domain at all times. And so if you know the domain density as a function of time, you can directly obtain what the domain size is as a function of time. So through this string of calculations, you can exactly calculate what the domain size is as a function of time. This kind of calculation has been around for decades, and it's commonly used in colloidal flocculation. 
Now, it all comes down to what is the value of this effective rate constant? Because this term over here in this equation is like an undergraduate chemical kinetics equation of a second order irreversible chemical reaction that's severely diffusion limited. So let me give you a flavor of what this effective rate constant looks like in the simple toy example problem of a simple shear flow of hard disks without hydrodynamic interactions. We have a non-dimensional shear rate given by a Peclé number, and we can solve this problem in the limit of weak shear flows. What we get is that the effective rate constant looks as the thermal energy KT divided by the viscosity times the domain size. The first term of one gives exactly the passive scaling of time to the one-third power. That's good because what this shows us is that when the Peclé number or the flow rate goes to zero, this calculation gives us exactly time to the one-third scaling that's known for classical phase separation. Now, the regular perturbation expansion solution can correct this term with a term that looks like Peclé to the one-half power. And this term is the first effect of a weak shear flow on the rate constant. And if you go through the calculation, what you find is that this second, this second term, or the first correction, gives us the domain scaling that looks like t to the two-thirds power. So what this toy calculation tells us is that even with a very weak amount of shear flow, you can dramatically enhance the rate at which domains are coming together and colliding into each other, especially because it's transport limited. OK, so now it turns out that rotational flow has no impact to the coarsening at all. It stays as time to the one-third power, as you would expect, because rigid body rotation of a domain doesn't change its relative distance, so it doesn't change its collision rate. So what this means is that extensional flow is just a difference between shear flow and rotational flow. So extensional flow, turns out, is just the same as shear flow. So in our system, there's a combination of different types of flows, shear flow over there, rotational flow, extensional flow over there, and some combination of those things. And we, what this argument uh, tells us is that with a very weak amount of active flows here and there, you can dramatically enhance the scaling of the coarsening rate. And that's actually consistent with our time to two thirds power as well. So that was coarsening arguments based on coalescence. I like to talk about a very different mechanism of coarsening due to Oswald ripening. In this picture, the domains are not treated as colloidal particles, but instead a collection of lipid molecules. The molecules can dissolve into the background majority phase and diffuse around the majority uh, phase and then condense onto a nearby droplet. So it's a molecular dissolution and condensation mechanism, very different from two big colloids fusing together to form a, a bigger one. Okay? So in Oswald ripening, what we do is evolve a quantity called the membrane order parameter, which also satisfies a convection diffusion equation, like the one you can see here. But instead, the diffusion is driven by gradients in the chemical potential. Okay? This term over here is the usual double well potential, the equation of state for the bulk uh, equation of state term. And secondly, we have line tensions that penalize square gradients in your membrane order parameter. So now what we can do is we need some kind of description for the velocity field that we can add to the left-hand side. We can return to the experimental conditions, do velocimetry of the ac actin channel to look at the velocity profile generated by the active flows. We can stick this velocity profile into this left-hand side term here, numerically evaluate this differential equation, and evolve those solutions. So here is the numerical solution of this equation with experimentally derived velocity fields inputted into left-hand side. So you can see that the domains become non-circular, they become elongated, looking qualitatively similar to what we observe experimentally for the domains. So now we can return to the domain size as a function of time. This plot you've already seen before experimental data for the passive and active case. And what we're going to do is to now superimpose on top of this numerical solutions to this also ripening membrane order parameter evolution for different values of the Peclé number. So experimentally, we can obtain what the shear rate is, but we're going to vary the membrane parameters of line tension and membrane mobility to generate different values of the Peclé number. So for small values of the Peclé number, we find that it converges to the passive scaling of one-third power. But as we increase convection, as we increase the Peclé number, we find that the slope increases. So now there is a dramatic enhancement to the rate at which domains grow as a function of time. And you can see that all experimental data fall along the values of 10 to the minus 4, 
and 5 times 10 to the minus 3. So when we actually go back to our values of the Peclet number and look back to past literature in experimental measurements of the line tension and membrane mobility for lipid bilayers, these numbers that we find here are perfectly consistent with what we obtain in the literature. So these are quantitatively consistent with each other. Okay, so, so far I've told you a lot about the size of the domain and how it grows as a function of time. In summary, the passive case, the domains remain circular, they grow slowly, like time to the one-third power. In the active case, the domains are non-circular and they grow faster, like t to the two-thirds power. Now I'd like to move on to addressing the second question of what is the size? Okay, that was, that was just talking about the size. I'd like to move on and talk about the structure. How does the structure of the domain change when you add active flows? So in the passive case, they grow circular, they distribute it in some way, but when you add active flows, you see that the domains become very non-circular, elongated, they fuse, they merge, they undergo highly complicated dynamics. Here's another iteration of the experiments. We have the domain channel, the actin network, and then the composite merge of the two channels. Okay? So you can really see that the passive case looks very different when you add active surface flows. So one way to characterize the structure of a system like this is to calculate what's called the dynamic structure factor, which is a memory function. So at very small times, all the way over here, the system has complete memory of its initial state, and therefore it has perfect memory of value of one. But in time, what ends up happening is through diffusion, the memory of the system becomes lost, and therefore the system no longer remembers about its initial condition, and therefore the memory function goes to zero at very long times. For the passive case, that's what I'm plotting here in white symbols. You can see that the, the memory decays kind of slowly, but it decays. And you can actually show that for the passive case, it decays like an exponential. And the fit of the exponential function will actually give us the diffusion coefficient of the domains. So now if we go to the active case, we can plot the exact same metric. What we find is that the active case, the memory of the domains, are lost significantly faster as a function of time. Okay, so the system forgets about its initial condition faster in time. And that kind of makes sense because if you were to take a stirring rod and place it at the interface and mix it around, it would generate chaotic flows around its vicinity, which will entrain the domains and mix it around. And of course, if you add convective mixing, it's going to forget about <laughs> its configuration faster. So what we essentially have is a complicated mixture of stirring rods that's mixing up the interface. And that's why the memory function decays faster as a function of time. So now we'd like to understand this result theoretically in returning to the membrane order parameter in its evolution equation. Until now, we've been putting an externally derived velocity field or an experimentally derived velocity field into the left-hand side there. But you can also have a separate evolution equation for the velocity field. And we need a model for the velocity field, which we're going to take as the incompressible toner 2 equation shown here. So on the top equation, we have the continuity equation that imposes incompressibility. On the bottom one is our momentum balance. The first four terms have terms that look just like the Navier-Stokes equations, the same terms, except with a couple of corrections. So for the first correction is a term that accounts for flocking. Physically, what this term represents is that fluid elements will tend to align with each other to form local flocks that move together. It's got the usual Landau-Cortic-like form, except the velocity is the order parameter. This term was initially used to describe flocking of birds and schools of fish in the ocean. Okay, another correction that we've added to this term is an osmotic stress. Physically, what this represents is that when you have an actin flow coming along, it will hit the edge of the domain, and it'll feel a steep gradient in the membrane density. So it's gonna feel a very sharp thermodynamic driving force that will push against the active fluid and that will appear as a body force. And therefore, this term is important because it adds a body force back into the momentum balance. This term is also important because this is the term that couples this momentum balance back to the membrane order parameter. Without this term, it's just a one-way coupled problem of the velocity field that you can solve separately and then plug it into the left-hand side of the membrane density equation. Okay, so this is a two-way coupled problem, and this kind of problem is called a model H framework. Now, there's one additional thing I need to tell you about. This rate of strain term uh, E, in addition to its usual viscous terms, there's another term that accounts for alignment stresses. 
The physical interpretation of this term is that when molecular motors will grab onto the biopolymers, they'll generate a force along its alignment direction, which will cause forces and flows along its principal direction. And the strength of that force is modulated by the prefactor of the value of S. And in the subsequent slides, I'm going to value, I'm going to uh, uh, change the value of S to modulate the strength of this alignment stress. Good. So now we can solve this equation numerically. Here we have the solution to the membrane density order parameter equation in the absence of any active flows. They grow circular, they grow bigger slowly as a function of time, t to the one-third power. Now I'm going to add some active flows. Now we are solving the momentum balance coupled to the membrane order parameter. On the top row, I have the flow vorticity field. And on the bottom, I have the membrane order parameter field. So now you can see that for this particular value of the alignment stress, we're getting turbulent-like chaotic flows to be present in the vorticity field. And you can see even wave-like properties, right? Propagation of waves of these vortices that uh, propagate in space. And the corresponding membrane domain is responding very violently to the flow vorticity. Okay? So if you take these circular domains, mix it with this flow field, the output is this crazy, highly dynamical membrane dynamics. Okay? So you can qualitatively see the strong impact that velocity fields have on the evolution of the membrane domains. We can plot a different value of the alignment stress, a slightly weaker value. And this value is kind of a special value because the turbulent nonlinear velocity term on the left-hand side of the momentum balance equation goes away. And so you don't get wave-like propagation of the vortex. And instead, you're going to get a lattice of vortices that switch in sign and alternate next to each other. And so naturally, what you get is a domain that looks characteristically very different because the flow field is very different. Essentially, the kinetic energy or the power spectrum of the flow field will directly inform the dominant wavelengths of the membrane density channel. Okay, Good. So now we can return to the experimental velocity field and the um, membrane order parameter field and compare qualitatively uh, against what we find numerically. And we find that qualitatively, the stronger alignment cases seem to uh, agree more with the morphology and structure of what we find from the experiments. So now if we go to the memory function that we plotted earlier, the white points are the experimental values that I showed you earlier for the passive and active case. We've superimposed on top of that two particular solutions of the uh, uh, incompressible toner 2 equations coupled to the membrane order parameter, so the numerical theoretical solution for two different values. So the stronger alignment case of s equal to 7 has a more rapid decay of the memory function, which is to be expected because you have a stronger wave-like propagation along your system that will entrain the domains and make it lose its memory faster. Interestingly, you're also seeing oscillations of the memory function, and that's directly due to the fact that you have waves propagating, and waves will tend to generate oscillating memory function decays. Good. So, so far in this talk, I've, I've told you about how activity modulates the size and the structure of the domains. In summary, for the passive case, domains grow circular, they go slowly, like time to the one-third power. In the active case, they become non-circular, they grow faster, like time to the two-thirds power, or they can even be faster than that. And the memory decays much faster compared to the passive case. Good. So in the last part of this talk, I'd like to move away from activity and talk about the role of elasticity. There's been a lot of work over the last 10, 15 years or so about the behavior of viscous droplets embedded in an elastic media. And people have looked at how the phase behavior of these viscous droplets are coupled to the background elasticity of the network. What we have is a two-dimensional viscous droplet inside a elastic or viscoelastic actin network. And this two dimensions versus three dimensions has some interesting comparisons. So first of all, the reduced dimensionality of our system means that there's one less degree of freedom for the membrane domains to escape. So if I have an actin filament squeezing a domain together, 
the domain can't eject into and out of the plane. So it's stuck in that dimension. So it can either deform, it can melt, or it can resist the elasticity. Okay? Another interesting difference concerns with the length and time scales of our systems. In many of the past work on three-dimensional uh, viscous droplets embedded in elastic media, the size of the droplet was large compared to the mesh size of the surrounding elastic network. So effectively, the droplets are seeing a continuum elastic media. In contrast, in our system, the droplets are small, and droplets are small and also comparable to the mesh size of the actin network. They're both on the order of microns. So what this means is that each of these droplets are feeling the local elastic properties of the network as opposed to a continuum elastic property. And the result of that is each droplet will feel an anisotropic heterogeneous stress distribution. And you can actually get very non-circular triangular shapes to emerge within this network. So as my student was making this measurement in the microscope room and I was watching these measurements being done and saw these very non-circular triangular domains, I had a sudden flashback to an experience I had in Japan where there was an escape room game in Japan where there are riddles and puzzles written along the walls of this room. And you have to answer those riddles and puzzles quickly because they also place a balloon that's filled with air that's inflating as a function of time. So you have this balloon inflating, you have to answer all these questions in real time because if you don't answer them fast enough, the balloon just keeps expanding, you're coordinating with your friends, you need to answer these questions, but if you're too slow, the balloon just explodes in your face. So it's a game that really tests the friendship and the loyalty of the people that you go with. And as I was being crushed by this balloon in the room, I thought, only the Japanese would come up with a game like this. I'm either very proud or slightly embarrassed to be Japanese. In any case, I thought this was a perfect analogy for the system that we have. We have a droplet that's inflating due to the thermodynamic driving force, but the resisting elasticity could be strong enough to cause the droplet to take non-circular or non-spherical shapes. And in fact, if we go to our experiments and we increase the density of actin within the system, so increase the elastic forces in the system, you can convert the droplets from becoming very circular to something that is highly triangular. So until now, we've talked a lot about how the properties of the network, the activity, the elasticity, could have an impact on the droplets themselves. But here is a long time lapse of the droplets coarsening and growing bigger as a function of time. And what you're seeing is that the droplets initially begins triangular, becomes more and more circular and bigger as a function of time. And the thermodynamic driving force is strong enough to actually displace the actin and allow it to relax even faster. So this is this instance where you can see that the thermodynamics of the droplet actually makes a direct impact on the relaxation of the network. So it's really an arrow that goes in both directions. And there are other interesting effects within the system. For example, right here, there is a domain that initially begins small but becomes larger and larger at the expense of neighboring droplets over here that initially began big but become smaller and smaller. That is the opposite of how I would use uh, to describe Oswald ripening, right? Big domains get bigger at the expense of smaller droplets. That's classical Oswald ripening, but here it seems to be the opposite. So what this suggests is that the elasticity of the network can be strong enough to cause the big domains to clash first and opening a pocket for another domain to grow there. Finally, we're developing a phase field model with elasticity to try to reproduce some of the effects that we're observing here. For example, when you add elasticity, you can actually get very non-circular cusps and corners to form, which is the first indication that we're trying to, we're, we're uh, successful in modeling some aspects of the sharp corners and cusps and non-circular non shapes that we obtain in our experiments. With that, I just wanted to conclude by saying that we're working on this devilishly complicated 
surface of the cell membrane, where it has a surface that shares its border with the external world. And the way the surface interacts inside the cell is very different from how it interacts outside. And I think we're just chipping the surface by telling, uh, telling uh, you know, how the viscous droplets behave and respond to activity and elastic forces. With that, I'd like to thank the researchers in my lab and especially thank Daniel and Akanksha for pushing and leading this project. Thank you.